just uh, a formal introduction is optional and that's fine with me. We're just ready to roll. Um, uh, <laughs> so um, I guess at Michigan we have this tradition of being the lucky presenters when someone else has done a lot of the work. I would be remiss at um, not pointing out that I'm the third author on this. Michael Brown, who's now at Iowa State, worked on this paper, as well as Matt DeMondbrun, who is either just finished or finishing his PhD. So I'm lucky to have these two uh, guys to work with, and um, we this will follow nicely from the other paper that you just heard from Chris. We uh, did some very similar things. So we're also looking at co-enrollment, and um, to do that, we looked at academic functioning and indicators of difficulty, being course difficulty. We looked at curriculum um, and developed co-enrollment measures. And let me tell you, then we'll, I'll discuss the findings from that and some of the implications for future work. So um, what we know, and has already kind of come out in the comments, is that courses um, aren't taken in isolation, right? Students enroll in a multiple number of courses over the time, and each of those courses have different rhythms, right? If it's a course that has a big midterm and a big final, or it's a course that is sort of more, <clears throat> the, the grade is compiled over time. Um, this was actually a graph from um, uh, our LAC 17 paper, and these were um, differences in patterns of use for, of a specific tool between students who were um, in some academic, academic difficulty and some who were doing just fine. And you can see their pattern of use over time is quite different, although the overall pattern is very similar. So that paper we presented last year, but the point is that we wanna um, emphasize how students are engaging in multiple concurrent academic tasks over time, often competing with competing goals. Do I do work hard in this class or that class when I have tests on the same day? And um, so then we um, look at students who are enrolled in science, engineering, math, and technology courses. At the paper we did in LAC 16, we looked at, we categorized courses uh, according to um, Biglin's model, I think his name is, where we looked at uh, hard peer, hard applied, and soft applied courses and looked at, um, how students were doing in those courses over time, and you can see that there's a there's a difference across the semester in um, in how they're uh, doing as well. So basically, the point is that the curricula that students take constitutes a very complex network of interdependencies and competing demands and and ideas, and and students aren't all taking the same course patterns, right? You as as uh, Chris pointed out. Sometimes you're overlapping with your peers in two courses or three courses or maybe only one course. So the question is, does it matter which courses you take in the same semester? And that's what we're going to talk about today. So we had three research questions for this paper and they are presented here, but basically we wanna know about co-enrollment and does being co-enrolled in some classes increase a student's odds of experiencing academic difficulty? Is there something about difficult classes? It sort of makes sense. If you have a bunch of hard classes, it's probably gonna be harder to do well in all of them, so let's take a look at that. And if you're getting into trouble in one course, does it leak over into your other courses? So those are the questions that we asked. And how we did this, we picked one course as a focal course. And this was a co in our College of Engineering. It was a required CS course for all computer science majors and also taken by a bunch of non-majors. It's a very large course. And so we looked at uh, one term of these courses, so almost 1,000 students, where you can see here the uh, makeup of our, of our population. They're mostly first and second year students, so referring back to this comment about it's harder to change your GPA later. So these are students who are really still kind of getting into their academic rhythm and figuring out how to be successful students. <clears throat> now what we use for our metric um, for talking about when students are in academic difficulty comes from an early warning system 
um, that our academic advisors at our institution use that um, I helped co-develop with some other very bright students and we presented this at the second LAC in Vancouver, I think. But basically what it does is it gives academic advisors feedback about whether the student is doing very well, they appear as a green indicator, and that means encourage these students. They're doing great. The advisors should encourage them to keep doing what they're doing. If they're yellow, that they're kind of teetering on the edge of getting themselves in some trouble, and the uh, academic advisor might want to explore what's going on with this student. And red is uh, engaged, like these students are in trouble. You need to engage with them and figure out how you can help them. So it's really the red, yellow, uh, and green model that comes from the course tools you or uh, what's it called? Purdue's signals. Thank you. That's the one. So. The point is that this actually gives us data to work with as well, as well because the advisor gets this for every week in the term. So now rather than asking about the student's grade in the course at that point in time, we can say at each week point in time, is the student red, yellow, or green? Like how are they performing relative to the other students in that course? So what we then looked at was the student explorer category per week. We did a course difficulty. So what we did is we looked at these courses and calculated, um, we called courses difficult if over time 25% of the students were in the yellow category and 10% were in the red category. If, the, if there were that many students in those two positions in a course, we called it a difficult course because there were courses for which the numbers were much fewer and most students were green. Those, we didn't call those easy courses, but we called the others difficult courses. And the third one, uh, course type, we looked at some broad disciplinary categories like art and design, business, engineering, humanities, math, sciences, and social science, rather than this hard, pure, applied, soft thing. And um, we also used a math placement score because these are students in our engineering college. They've all taken a math placement exam for a university that's been used for years to place student into uh, math classes. And the uh, college really relies on those. Um, and uh, we took demographics out because when we had things like gender, year of study, and academic major in the model, they did nothing. So we did put those in, but we, um, we abandoned them when they didn't show anything. So what we have here are two different uh, methods that we use to ask these different research questions. We have these logistic model, regression models, um, as well as a survival analysis. And that's, uh, I'm gonna tell you what we found from them and how they relate to each question. So first, the question of um, disciplinary co-enrollment. And really what I want you to notice here, and I'm gonna show you this table twice and talk about different parts of it is right here, um, really a, a strong predictor is their math score. And what this shows is that the higher your math score is, the lower you are at risk for academic difficulty in the focal course. So how well, how well your math chops were mattered for how well you would do in this course. Um, and you'll see over here in this part of the table that um, the kind of course didn't matter at all. Now looking at another part of this for, for research question too is co-enrollment in other difficult courses. Does that affect where you're doing? And that comes here and you can see that we're finding um, significant effects for if you're in trouble in the focal course, uh, you're probably, you're likely to be in trouble in your other courses and at least in at least one other difficult course, right? So. Um, Taking all those hard courses in the same term uh, is, uh, increases your odds of being in difficulty in the focal course by 71%. Now this table um, addresses the issue of prior academic difficulty in another course um, being related to um, difficulty in the focal course. And what you can see here, this is the sur survival analysis model. Um, and what happens is students who are co-enrolled in a difficult course, a 60% increase in experience in academic difficulty. But again, note that course type was not uh, an issue, was not there. So what this looks like over time, so what you've got here, oh, thank you, is um, 
students who, so remember prior difficulty means like the week before, were you red or yellow or green? And what we've done here is collapse the red, uh, even though the colors, I'm sorry, the colors are yellow and red, but it's really the, the yellow line is students who were uh, not experienced difficulty in the week before in any of their courses, and the red line is students who showed difficulty the week before in any of their courses. And so what you can see here is that um, academic difficulty in any other course, again, increases the odds by 24% of find, being in academic difficulty in the focal course. And by week five, uh, that's when the decline is more rapid for these students who are in trouble. So it just starts piling on, right? And they have uh, less difficult, they have more difficulty trying, uh, less probability of digging themselves out, um, at least in the focal course. And that makes sense too, right? Especially when course grades are cumulative and you don't allow students to do things like throw out your lowest grade or retake exams, those kinds of things. So really what I want you to take away is that, um, First of all, in contrast to uh, prior work, disciplinary course type did not predict academic difficulty. But diffi the, how difficult those courses are, how likely it is that you're enrolled in a course where you may not do well um, because a significant number of students don't, um, really increases your odds of getting in difficulty in the, in the target course. Um, and that it piles on, if you're in trouble the week before, the likelihood that you're gonna keep being in trouble just keeps adding adding up. So what does this mean for us? Um, we're thinking about, um, the implications are one for academic planners, right? We need to be advising students, particularly students perhaps in this case with lower in math scores, to not take these courses in the same semester, to figure out how to spread them around so that you're not piling on hard courses and, and with a lot of confidence that the student is gonna experience academic difficulty across these courses. And so students can avoid risky combination of courses, right? And, and we can do a little better um, academic planning and look at our curriculum a little more carefully because a lot of places and certainly in our school, especially in that first and second year, you're told you're gonna take this course and this course and this course in this semester of your uh, freshman term and, and so but we need to be more sensitive to the different kinds of students to say maybe maybe for these students that's okay, but for these students we need to move things around a little bit. So what we're doing is um, in the future we're replicating this because as I discussed, we, we used a focal course as a comparison course and we can look at other sort of targeted, required, uh, difficult courses that are deeply embedded in a curriculum and see how these results replicate. Um, especially where these high stakes focal courses that weed people out, like if you don't do well in this course, you're pretty much told you can't be a major um, or it's really not a good idea. So how can we help more students be successful in these, in these kinds of curriculums? And uh, we'd like to scale it up. And um, we'd like to see that we can recommend integrating this with other uh, course recommender and advisor systems. But I wanted to tell you today. So thank you very much. Um, Stephanie, that you're looking into something that we're very uh, interested in. I'm, well, I'm sure I'm not alone in this. Um, and I'm also very glad to hear particularly your comments at the end regarding concerns about uh, potential for students to be advised out of uh, specific majors. That's huge. It is. Um, and so I don't know that your findings speak to this, but do you have thoughts about, uh, oh, some of the kinds of just-in-time learning possibilities that might support students who find themselves co-enrolled? Um, you know, because there, there, I, I think that there are probably going to be different degrees of, different extents to which that will actually work. When I think, for yeah. example, about students who are co-enrolled in, uh, let's say, college algebra and first year chemistry, if they're learning the algebra while they need to be applying it, that may or may not come in time. Mm -hmm. uh, but for people for whom they just didn't learn the algebra well, but they 
did have it in their past, perhaps some just-in-time learning might be useful. So are, are you beginning to have conversations about what that will look like? Well, we know there are these systems that other people are working with that are course recommender systems. Um, and so we, we really think that partly what this work brings is a, is a enriching network even further to think about different uh, aspects uh, that should feed into these recommender systems, right? Um, we were really uh, kind of excited when we decided, well, wait, instead of using grades and those kinds of things, let's just use these weekly performance indicators that come to the academic advisors. And when we built that system, how many years ago? Uh, six or seven years ago, we specifically built it for advisors, academic advisors, not only because they asked us for it, but also because we knew in their head they knew lots about diagnosing a student's problem and suggesting the right resources for the student. But that's all in the, that's all in the academic advisor's head. And in the case of the first application of this, these academic advisors were in a very special program with a high touch advising for the student. So they also knew the students well. So if you came into my office and I told you what courses to take, probably already knew what your math score was and I knew what your high school GPA was and I knew what your incoming test scores were. And so I'm tailoring my advice to you accordingly. Although when you scale this up and you get big departments and certainly our engineering college broadly and the, maybe your academic your advisor is someone you've never met before, they don't know you, you get a different one each term. We don't have all that embedded knowledge, so how can we put it in these systems? Thank, Thank you. you. I'm curious about the weekly warning system and what mm -hmm. that's based on. Is that from L LMS? Is that something that faculty are entering or what? Uh, no, it comes, uh, it comes right out of our LMS and the algorithm underlying it looks like this. Um, I know it's a little hard to read, but um, we developed it uh, to be course agnostic. So we wanted to always measure student re performance relative to other students in that course, because that way we didn't have to worry about how the grades were being determined across courses. And so um, it based first on the student's grade so far in the course, it comes out of the LMS grade book. Um, and the difference from the course average uh, and you can't read the small text there. And then we threw in these course site logins as some crude measure of engagement because if everybody was logging onto the course site like a lot and you were never logging in, probably you weren't you know, getting the materials you needed, you weren't doing the practice homeworks or whatever it is. So we used that column to sort of tip the scale about if you're on the edge of being uh, green and yellow, for example, how much you deviate from from your other fellow students in the login determines whether you end up here or here. And then in the um, advisor view of this, they can drill down and look at the student in any particular course and actually access the full grade book and see, you know, are they doing all the homework but they're not doing well in the exams versus they're not turning any of the homework, no wonder they're not doing well in the exams. So advisors have access to the Advisors only. Grade books. This system right but now grade, is only available to advisors. And that includes their, the grade books that are currently in those classes yes. as part of it? Yep. Okay. Comes right out of our LMS. We used to be a Sakai school and we've gone Canvas and our the Wizards and our um, Digital Information Greenhouse have figured out while we're still running two systems how to put both sets of grades in and basically uh, eventually will of course be only be Canvas. Does it include attendance? Not in this model, but um, this this is the original algorithm and it certainly could um, use updating. So, thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you.